Welcome to chapter 6, the transport layer. Transport layer, finally we made it. Now we are above the network layer. Now we are talking end-to-end -end communication. What does this mean, end-to-end -end communication? Well, now virtually we transport across, however the network looks like, data from one transport layer to the other, end-to-end. We will see that we transport data from, for example, one socket to another socket across our communication system, as I explained to you in all the other chapters. So, all the layers below the transport layer, you will find them on hosts, on the routers. We learned what the switches are, repeaters, and typically all these operate in a hop to hop fashion. Now the transport layer is only available on the hosts and this transport layer operates in an end-to-end -end fashion. So this is basically like a pipe, a pipe connecting one process, one application with another application. And the idea here is that we encapsulate all our data, we create a dedicated header and then we forward the data. You see on the right hand side I payload here, that's the data we get from a process and then we create the transport header and as you know the network header and the frame. So nothing unusual here. What we will see is that here in the transport layer we have some interaction between this layer, layer 4 and layer 3. So, for example, we learn that layer 3 can inform layer 4 about congestion, too much data in the network. Okay, so what is fine about the transport layer? We are now above the network layer. We have a path from the source really to the destination. We don't care about all these intermediate devices. So, network layer, yes. That's a best effort, but we will see on the transport layer we can do much more. So that's nice. But if you really look at the problem, now transporting data end-to-end, -end, we also have a problem. We are back to problems from the link layer. Who? Why from the link layer? Well, <clears throat> for example, do we match the receiver rate so maybe we flood a receiver with too many packets per second. What about controlling the access to the network? Do we create congestion? Things like this. Can we guarantee transmission? What about the order of the packets? This, this was much easier on the link layer, but now we have this network layer in between. Best effort, we don't guarantee anything. And now maybe on layer four, we want to guarantee something again. We'll see that we have again to face the problems of the link layer when it comes to flow of the data sliding window. Just a keyword, we'll come back to this. So now, what kind of services do we typically provide on the transport layer? End to end, now reliability. No matter what happens in the lower layers, the different networks, different autonomous systems, whatever, we want to have maybe a reliable transfer end-to-end, -end. also flow control, control the congestion of the traffic, multiplexing, demultiplexing, because we may have many applications running over the same network, same connection, so we have to multiplex and demultiplex. Okay, so what is the content of this chapter? First, I will go through the basic goals, requirements of the transport layers, show you some basic elements for transport layers, independent of internet or not internet. And then I will cover the classical transport layer protocols. TCP, for example, is there since 1974 with the first ideas, TCP, UDP, the most prominent of the classical protocols. And then I will cover some newer developments like multipath, TCP, and Quick. So first of all, some goals, some requirements of the transport layer. Well, most prominent is reliability, end-to-end -end reliability. Remember, network layer in the internet, well, we don't guarantee anything. 
But now maybe we want to guarantee that packets that are sent are really indeed delivered. So <laughs> why not delivered? Well, we have all these links and the routers. Why should they drop a packet? Well, maybe we have too much traffic in the network. So we have buffer overflows. And what do routers do? They will drop the packets. Maybe they return ICMP messages, maybe not. But if there's overload, all you can do in the network is dropping packets. Okay, that's not so nice. It could be also a router that crashes. Maybe the path doesn't exist. We learned that on the network layer, we try to find a path, but maybe there's a router failure, a link failure, so the path doesn't exist. So what about reliability? We have a problem. So we have to fix this. Also, the reliability of certain order. Maybe we want to guarantee that the packets arrive in the order we've sent. So why should they go a different way? Well, because all the packets we learned they're processed independently. So each time the router receives a packet, the router decides to take this way or that way. So if we have such a network, maybe one packet goes along the green path, the next one goes along the orange path. So in the destination, they might be in a different order. So that's one of the problems. So reliability, order reliability, delivery reliability. Next topic, flow control. So as I said, similar to layer two, maybe the receiver is not capable to receive this high rate of new packets. So we need some techniques to match source sending rate with the destination receiving rate. Similar to link layer. There we had our sliding window, but we had only one link. There were no complicated network topology in between. Now we may have the whole internet between the sender and the receiver. How do we do this? And you can uh, think of this flow control like you have a bucket. A bucket is filled by water source and the water trips into the bucket or you simply flood the bucket and sooner or later, uh, well, maybe there's an overflow inside the network. Uh, we'll handle this in a second. But we may have a problem that there's simply too much water flowing out of this pipe to the destination and the destination cannot handle it. So if the destination says, oh, I cannot handle this, well, sooner or later, well, we will have an overflow. So flow control has to adjust the flow of the water of our packets so that the bucket neither overflows nor empties. So overflow because the destination cannot really handle this flow of water of packets. We'll say, okay, stop, I have to process the packets. And then sooner or later, there will be some water spilled over. The routers will drop or the destination will drop. Additionally, in addition to this flow control, which is end-to-end, -end, we'll also have a congestion control. What's this? So maybe the network is overloaded. So maybe the receiver is fast enough, but maybe we have a problem with the network. So maybe we have many, many sources, and imagine you have a poor router somewhere and many sources entering this router, and there's only one outgoing link for all the packets, then you will simply overload the router and the router will drop packets. So the congestion control now has to adjust all the different sources so that we don't have an overflow inside the network. So congestion control, that's about overflow inside the network. And typically, well, we don't have any communication between the different sources. Well, the different sources are all these millions of computers somewhere on this planet and they try to communicate with different destinations. Okay, so that's also difficult. So one is flow control end to end, don't flood the receiver. Another topic is congestion control, don't flood the network. There might be a bottleneck link in the network. So how do we do this? Then we have to discuss multiplexing and demultiplexing. So we have many different applications 
and those applications, they share the same interface to the network layer. So we all have the same IP address, but we have many applications running. So we need multiplexing and demultiplexing techniques because there might be a packet arriving at a certain IP address. And does this go to certain browsers, messengers or whatever? So we need multiplexing and demultiplexing techniques. So there's a lot to think of and there are many more requirements and, well, some applications really need this. Maybe you need end-to-end -end reliability, money transfer, something like this. You need congestion control. Other applications, they simply do not care. Maybe some applications, they have really tight real-time requirements. Some others, they do not, like email, for example, like money transfer. It's not really real-time, but interactive gaming that's real time okay so there are different characteristics that the transport layer must have so also to to guarantee this reliability or real time additionally it must be efficient so we cannot create a complex uh, control systems with a lot of overhead we'll also several times discuss fairness why fairness? Well, if you have a certain bottleneck link and you have many traffic streams that try to go through, maybe a good idea is to have some kind of equal slices of this throughput. And if there's a certain overload situation, maybe we can try, at least try to guarantee uh, that there's no starvation for single users. Stability is also an issue. Imagine there's suddenly a burst of traffic from one source. So how fast can we reach this fairness, for example? So these are, there are many, many challenges. And uh, you have to be aware that we have to build these new services like reliability, real-time, fairness, whatever, on the basic services provided by the network layer. So, well, the network layer, what does it offer to us? Not too much. So it's best effort. And uh, the network layer maybe doesn't tell us if some packet reached a destination. Maybe there's a error message. So we have to create new mechanisms to guarantee all these requirements or at least try to reach your requirements. So what are the elements we have in the transport layers? And these are the elements we will see in those protocols like UDP and TCP and multipath, TCP, quick. So first of all, multiplexing and demultiplexing. We have a huge network, the internet, and here for our transport layer, we always want to communicate typically from one computer here across the network to another computer. We learned we have IP addresses and we learned how we can find a path from the source IP address to the destination IP address. So this was all this about routing, the routers, BGP, OSPF, etc. So the network layer provides us with an end-to-end -end path from the source IP address to the destination IP address. Okay, but now we have applications additionally. So applications, they use our application layer protocols using our transport layer. And all these applications, they run over the same network interface. This is why we need this multiplexing and demultiplexing. And in the internet, we have additionally, to our IP layer, we have port numbers. So in the internet, we use those port numbers in general. Those are service access points of a layer four. And those port numbers are needed if we send something. Then, well, we have an IP address. We have a certain port and we have our data. And also the receiver, our receiving process, listens at a certain port. So we will learn that the receivers have to listen at a certain port and this port 
is known by the sender because the sender will integrate this receiving port in the data packet so that the receiver knows, okay, there's incoming packet, okay, and now, oh, to which port do I forward? Do I demultiplex this packet? Because I know there's a process waiting at this port. So multiplexing, demultiplexing in the internet uses ports and the ports are then used to identify certain applications. If we implement this, we use the sockets. And the sockets, this is what the operations, uh, operating system is talking about. You create a socket, processes wait at sockets. And the socket contains the IP address and a port. And typically you use a socket pair to communicate from one computer to another one. So we need those sockets to identify the processes, to exchange data, so that, because the operating system has to know where it goes. If you talk about networks, we talk about ports, and the ports are the service access point identifiers for the layer four. Okay, so if you program your very communication, you need the socket API. And this is where you then have those functions for sending, for receiving something. And you need the port numbers. Port numbers in the internet, 16 bits from zero to 65,533. And the port numbers historically, they're divided into port numbers from zero to 1023. And they're used for so-called well-known services, also called system ports. For example, HTTP, the protocol you should know now, there is a process waiting behind port 80, and so on. There are some more port ranges. Next range are the registered or known as user ports. And then we have so-called dynamic or private ports. So, who assigns those ports? Well, the system ports, they are assigned by IANA and IETF, and then the registered also assigned by IANA with or without the IETF, but they're also used by operating systems. And you see it's, there are some differences between Windows and Linux, uh, what ports are actually used. So, and there's the link if you wanna learn more about port numbers. Okay, so we have the ports. The ports are used to demultiplex our packets and we'll see that the server process waits behind such a port. What else do we need? Well, so we now the multiplexing, we need primitives, transport layer service primitives. Very simple, very unreliable datagram service, connectionless. We'll learn that this is then realized, for example, by UDP. So unreliable datagram, bit more complicated, reliable service. So reliable service, that's exactly what is needed if you want to be sure that data arrives at the receiver. So and this is really some added uh, value compared to IP. There we'll see co classical connection-oriented service with establishment, communication, termination. There's also the possibility of reliable and connectionless, but let's first start with this unreliable, connectionless and reliable connection oriented. If we use this connection oriented transport, we learn that we have these classical primitives like we listen for incoming packets. That's typically what servers do. So they listen behind a certain port, they wait. And so the process, well, waits until data arrives. What the clients typically do is they first connect. We'll see how this works. So we try to establish a connection. Then we send data and we receive data. So if we have an active connection, we can receive data, send data and we can disconnect. So we want to release the connection. So these are the 
typical service primitives we use. Okay, so let's start. Let's create a connection. Hmm. Okay, this is easy to say, but this is already a bit tricky. Why? We'll see in a second. So let's establish the connection. Hmm. On transport layer, we do something that's called a three-way handshake. Uh, why three-way? Okay, first I will show how it works and then we'll discuss why only two ways or one-way handshake, that's not really a handshake, uh, doesn't work. Three-way handshake to verify that really I want to establish a communication and both sides can be sure that there is uh, that the connection is established. How does it work? So our classical message sequence diagrams. So our time flows from top to bottom. Host one wants to initiate. So what does host one do? Host one sends a connection request packet. Okay, fine. This shows host two. Oh, someone wants to connect. Now let's assume host two is nice and says, okay, fine, please establish. This means you send back some kind of acknowledgement. Okay, so now let's stop here. What do we know exactly at this point here? We know for host one, connection is established. What does host two know? At this point in time, Connect host 2 knows I received a connection request from host 1 and I responded. But, and this is the important thing you always have to consider, host 2 does not know that host 1 really received the acknowledgement. There could be something happening in between. And that's the problem always in communication. We have to try to establish a consistent view on a certain situation. In this case, connection establishment. Host 2 doesn't know that the acknowledgement really successfully has been received by host 1. And this is the reason why we need the third step. Because now... Not only host one knows the connection is established, also host two knows this. That's the idea. Yes, it could be the case that also this packet has been deleted. We will discuss this, what happens then. But for connection establishment, this three-way handshake is enough. Why? Because now, after sending this, this host can start sending data. And if you receive data, then host 2 could say, okay, um, I didn't get this official acknowledgement, but hey, host 1 is sending me data. So yeah, uh, okay, then connection is established and then I can also send data. And host 1 can be sure that host 2 has the same view on the situation as soon as host 2 sends data back. And then we have a connection established. We both send data in both directions and we are happy. So a two-way handshake has exactly the problem that host 2 doesn't know what's going on. So you need this third packet. The third packet could already contain data. We will see this is exactly what TCP does. But we are not there yet. So you learned already, hmm, it's not connection establishment, it's not that simple to do. So connection establishment already is surprisingly tricky. So this just a request and an okay, that's not sufficient because giving the okay, the connection accept, doesn't tell you if the other side, the initiator, really received the okay. Now, yeah, our network can lose packet. Uh, remember, IP, lose packets, store packets, duplicate packets, especially delayed duplicates. That's a big problem. And we will see 
delay duplicates. So for example, you create a duplicate of the connection request packet. You delay it and after a minute, this connection request again shows up. Uh, how to handle this? The problem is, how can you differentiate a real connection request from a delayed connection request? Hmm. So if we just have the situation that we have two hosts and then suddenly, well, a connection request shows up and maybe there was duplicate and now out of the blue, another connection request shows up. How can you say, oh, now that was a duplicate? And this is a reason why already here we need sequence numbers. Without sequence numbers, uh, well, we cannot differentiate a new connection request from a duplicated connection request. So just sending a connection request doesn't help. So we need a number telling us this was connection request 13. And if I receive 13 again, then I can say, no, wait, wait a moment. I already received 13. So we need sequence numbers. So there shouldn't be two identical numbered these connection requests out at the same time. And also we see also for data packets, uh, this shouldn't be the case. So we learned that if we really want to have a new connection, then we use a different sequence number. So we have to differentiate between those packets. So duplicated delayed data packets, uh, what happens if we really uh, do strange thing with control packets? Um, we will see that both sides have to agree on initial sequence numbers. So if we initiate this, establishing, like we learned with this three-way handshake. We need sequence numbers and we have to agree also in, on both sides, also for the acknowledgements. Somehow we, we, we have to react. We have to say, okay, I acknowledge also this connection request so that both hosts know this acknowledgement is now related to a certain connection request. And also if I send then this third packet, there must be a relation so that I, I mean here I, I, it's obvious because I look on this picture and I see both hosts, but I have to make sure that this acknowledgement really is related to this connection request. And here this acknowledgement has to be related to the other connection request acknowledgement. This has to be made sure. And we will see how the real protocols do this. If you think back in a two-way handshake scenario, this doesn't work. So just to show you what can happen and why we need this. Here you see the normal operation. Normal operation, that means you send the connection request the connection request now has our sequence number. Because we saw without sequence number, we cannot differentiate a duplicated connection request from a real new one. And you will see now that this acknowledgement exactly has this relation telling me, okay, I sent you back an acknowledgement and I refer to this connection request. This is done by this. But I myself also pick a number, now host2 picks a number, and here this acknowledgement now tells me, ah, okay, this belongs to the packet before. So that's the normal operation, and I will come back to what we do with the data. So you see this, we always have to need this reference so that we know, ah, okay, this packet now belongs to a certain flow. For us, looking at the picture, that's quite obvious. So does this really help? Okay, now let's duplicate something. So out of now, nowhere, we have this duplicate. So maybe, maybe in former times, we had this connection request with a sequence number equals X. So that was a minute ago, uh, everything was fine. 
And now suddenly we duplicate this old packet out of the blue. Then, okay, maybe uh, then that the host says, okay, um, acknowledgement, yeah, what is this? And then host one says, oh, no, uh, I haven't initiated this. And will maybe send back something like a reject referring to this telling host two, no, no, that was not really uh, something I sent. So host one doesn't know this X and rechecks, for example. We can make it even a bit more complicated. Uh, we can delay and duplicate connection request. We can also duplicate data. And uh, you will see that here we send also this duplicate. Host two doesn't know, okay, sends back the uh, acknowledgement. And before we receive the reject, here, rejecting this act and telling host two, oh, there was something going on that is wrong. Like in this example here, also out of the blue, we have a data packet. And the data packet fits perfectly to this uh, connection request. But as you see, we have the wrong number for the acknowledgement. And this tells the host, oh, this is a data packet. Uh, okay, this looks like, well, belonging to this connection request, but what is this acknowledgement? That acknowledgement really doesn't fit to the number I have chosen to this Y. Okay, could it be the case that this Z and Y are the same? It could, if you don't take care about your numbering. So we will learn that typically, if we do so, we have to freeze the numbers and we should not reuse certain numbers for some time to avoid problems like this. But if you wait for a certain time, then in the internet you can be sure that, well, sure, most likely there are no duplicates out of the blue because typically no one artificially confuses these systems. Okay, now you can play with all this acknowledgement, etc. So three-way handshake will solve the problems for the connection setup. The termination is more complicated. Why? I will explain. So connection termination, typically uh, you set up, so one, two, three, three a handshake, perfect. And then, um, well, you, you send your data, you continue sending a lot of data and why ever. So here host two says, stop it. And then sends a disconnect request. Okay, so this is abrupt with the disconnection. You will lose data because here, host two will not accept this. So you hang up the phone, for example. That's a quite classical uh, thing. So you continue talking on one side and the other side simply hang up. Then you lose some data. Okay, so one peer can now simply terminate the connection. That's it. But then you will lose something. Maybe, maybe this data was important. Okay, so maybe that's not the ideal solution. So. Maybe you want to do this in a more symmetric um, uh, way. And the symmetric release that enables the peer that didn't terminate the connection still to send data until you also terminate. Only the peer that terminated the connection is not allowed to continue to send something. So this is basically like two independent unicast connections and both peers have to terminate the connection explicitly. So that is uh, the, the idea if you do this in a symmetric fashion, okay? But the problem is, I mean, data loss can happen. And the, the, the problem always is, I mean, how much data is there still to be received? So if you say, okay, now I terminate, 
how long do you still want to participate? So sooner or later, also the other side uh, has to terminate. And can we be sure that the other side, respectively, received this disconnect request? So how can we solve this? Is there a optimal solution for connection termination? Hmm. So think of the case that you sent a disconnect request. You don't want to send any more data. And the other side sends you back the acknowledgement. So what do you know on the left side? For the right side, okay, fine. Everything is released. So because I sent a disconnect request, I got the acknowledgement. So everything is fine. But what do you know on the left side? Nothing, because the act could have been destroyed. So it might be a good idea, three-way handshake. I sent back an acknowledgement. This would be a cool idea, isn't it? Because then at this point, you know, I get the acknowledgement for the acknowledgement, then everything is released. Uh, but what do you know on this side? It could be the case that the acknowledgement has been destroyed. So is there an optimal solution? Well, the answer is hmm, no. Why? And this is called the two army problem. Think of the situation, you have two armies, so you have no, one side, part of the army, so that's army one, and you want to coordinate with the other side the attack at five o'clock in the morning. And your enemy is in between. So that's your enemy, army number two. So no wireless communication, no encryption, nothing, back, Roman, empire, whatever. So you send out someone to the other side, a poor guy, and this poor guy has the message, we attack at 5 a.m. This poor guy has to find a way through the other army to the enemy, and if the guy is lucky enough, can deliver the message, hey, we attack at 5 a.m. What do we know? Well, the right side here knows we attack at 5 a.m. Fine. The left side of the army, one, knows nothing. Because it could be the case that someone killed this poor guy crossing the enemy lines. So maybe it would be a good idea to send back someone telling Hey, yes, we received this 5 a.m. message. Perfect. Okay, going back. Then maybe this site is happy because it received the acknowledgement. But what do we know on this site? Maybe this guy has been killed. So we could send back someone and uh, then we know nothing here it's fine here we can again send again send uh, uh, you know so the problem is there is no solution at least no optimal solution so we cannot create a protocol that solves this but um okay maybe we are a bit riskier when releasing connections why well, in communication world, we don't want to communicate anymore. We want to release the connection. So um, we do a certain three-way handshake, but a bit a riskier uh, way of this three-way handshake. So we could do this three-way handshake. Now you send this connect request. And then we basically answer this with a disconnect request. We send acknowledgement. Problem not solved. But additionally, we do something. We start timers. So starting timers, that helps with a disconnect request. Why? If we lose, if we lose an acknowledgement, 
then we do not wait forever. We th simply say, okay, starting the timer here. If I don't get an acknowledgement, acknowledgement would be nice, perfect. That's, that's the nicest solution. But then we have a timeout. So if we, for example, do not get an acknowledgement for our disconnect re release after, let's say, one minute, then we simply shut down the connection using this timeout. So that's the idea. So we use timeouts. And this is not something you can, a uh, problem you can solve with a protocol, but with this additional help of timers. And then simply hoping there is no data just circulating, looping through the internet anymore, for example, after a minute. So we don't have delays of a minute. So this works and you can go through different scenarios of this loss of responses, for example, if you lose such a, a response, you may repeat your disconnect request and then release. If you lose everything, so maybe um, someone cut the wire, you send a disconnect request and then you cut the wire with a situation uh, that we lose everything, then also the timeouts will help us. So we will learn that with the help of timers and timeouts, we can solve this two army problem. That's something you cannot do with, uh, with armies, uh, so you need some way of coordination, but here now communication protocols, because we don't want to do anything after this uh, connection release, we can use timers. So you learned that for transport layers, to create certain reliability, to set up connections, we have to do a bit more. And this also tells you that connectionless services, so without creating any connections, um, way simpler. So UDP, we will learn, is way simpler compared to a TCP, but no reliability. So transport protocols, they also have to recover from crashes. So hosts can crash, routers can crash. So what happens? So think of a client sending large files to a server. So we will learn that typically each chunk, each segment of the data is acknowledged by a server. So you send the first part, one out of N, you get an acknowledgement. You send the second one, you get an acknowledge. Oh no, you have a crash. This may happen. Well, do we then continue sending the third one? So, okay, the, the server crashed and now what is the status? We have to be able to handle this. So after a crash, the server doesn't know uh, the, the status and the, the client, well, also, uh, well, what is the situation? So there are different client states. So maybe there's no acknowledgement outstanding. Maybe there's an acknowledgement outstanding. As we see here, there's one outstanding. So there are different strategies you can do. So for example, you can retransmit last package. You never retransmit. You can retransmit the last package uh, only in a situation of no outstanding uh, acknowledgement or you retransmit uh, if you are in this uh, state, you have an outstanding acknowledgement. So these are just examples. And you see, it depends now on the strategy, how you recover from these crashes. So on the server side, uh, also, when do you send an acknowledgement? Do you immediately send the acknowledgement when you receive the packet? before you write it to the application or you write the packet to the application and then send the acknowledgement. Well, the consequences, if a crash occurs between those two operations, they are quite different. You can imagine, I mean, if you send an acknowledgement and then you crash, then the client your sender thinks everything is fine on your side because you sent an acknowledgement. 
And then maybe the client deletes the data and thinks, oh, everything is fine. I got the acknowledgement. Yeah, because I received this acknowledgement. But it crashed here in between. So I never can write anything through the application. But the sender thinks the application, the server, got the data. Hmm, that's a problem. Or if I do it the other way around, I first write to the application and then I send the acknowledgement. Okay, but I have a crash in between. Maybe I never sent the acknowledgement. Okay, then the original sender will retransmit the data. And then maybe if I don't have any additional meshes, I write it again to the application. Because the sender thinks, okay, I don't get the acknowledgement. Oh, I have to send it again. So depending on how you handle this, what your strategy is in the client and the server, well, uh, there are different situations. So this just gives you an overview of parts of the problems uh, you may have. So this is the strategy of the server, for example, or now example that was the receiver. So the receiver here could say, okay, if I receive a packet, I first acknowledge, then I write. Or I first write, then I acknowledge. And remember, the crash may be right in between. We don't know. But writing a protocol, designing a protocol, we have to think of this situation. What does the sender do? The sender can say, okay, if I don't get an acknowledgement, I always retransmit. Or I can say, okay, I never retransmit. So these are the extreme uh, reactions. Or I can say, okay, I retransmit out depending on outstanding acknowledgements. So, okay. And you see that depending on this combination, without going now through all this, uh, you can stop here and have a deeper look and try to figure out this combination. Depending on the strategies on the receiver side and on the sender side, well, the protocol or simple idea may work correctly or you may, so it might be okay, or maybe you lose data, could be the case, or you create duplicates. Now, typically you try to design a protocol in a way that you can handle these situations, that you can find out that you receive duplicates. That you don't get a shock, but you can handle duplicates. And you can also handle a loss. You see, there could be situations where you lose data, where you create duplicates. So, hmm, seems to be complicated, but I will show you how, for example, TCP handles this. Okay, some simple questions. So, I told you that now we have certain issues back from the link layer here in the transport layer. Which and why? And what are the goals of a transport layer? General goals are well, different. Several goals. Multiplexing, demultiplexing. Why do we need this? Why can't we just forward the data to our application? And hmm, why is connection establishment and also connection release already that complicated? How do we handle packet loss? How do we handle a crashed server in between? And what is the role of timers? We need timers. Why do we need them?